is now starting. Let's attend to our listening mode. Uh, can you guys see the uh, the slide? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I know for a lot of you, definitely good afternoon, especially those folks in the East Coast. Uh, this is our uh, fourth uh, chat with uh, Green Aggies, um, our go-to webinar live. And uh, oh, gosh, I've already got questions. Uh, but uh, some of you have already got uh, a, um, a sent out an email to you to ask for your feedbacks. You know, which one you guys prefer this informative chat, you know, of various topics or a one topic and more uh, in-depth presentations. And the second question is about the timing. You know, right now we're doing it 12.30 uh, to roughly 1.30 every Thursday. You know, tell us if this is a convenient time for you or what's convenient for you. And then the third question is, you know, what we can do to improve your experience. So, you know, email your feedback and I'm probably gonna have a follow-up email uh, you know, and uh, send it to you guys so you don't have to remember these uh, three questions. Um, for those who have already uh, responded back, uh, I really appreciate your uh, feedback. Uh, some of the comments really made my day. So anything that, you know, you questions or feedbacks and stuff, send it to mgu at tamu.edu. You know, I worked really hard to make my email as short as possible uh, so you don't have to remember that many things. Yeah, uh, so would really appreciate some uh, feedbacks. Um, so, Yonki, you ready? This is your slide. So today, we're gonna start with Dr. Yonki Joe and look at some chinch bugs uh, in turf. So, uh, so Meng Meng is, uh, the, the audience can see my screen, my slide and also my pictures? Yes. Okay, good. Well, I have, I have a, one picture I want to show you the audience. So let's start it with the chinch bug. Um, I mean, you're probably aware of that. Uh, it's very common around uh, in anywhere in Texas. And even though we know a lot of uh, you know, chinch bug, we use still a lot of uh, grasses will, will be used uh, every summer. And so, before before it's too hot, this is a good time to think about the chinch bug because the as you, as you see in the pictures, um, you know in the late late summer, uh, people start to complain about their grasses dying because of too hot. I mean, it's, it's common if uh, your irrigations, you know, is not covered properly. This is very common. The grasses are, uh, you know, warm season grasses acclimated to our weather, hot and dry. However, uh, in the middle of summer, we have no rain, uh, like three weeks, four weeks. Uh, we need the we need the water, and the heat above uh, 900 in the summer is a lot of uh, transpirations uh, to make the plants are. Uh, Maintain, so they're losing a lot of water. Uh, so, you know, the to make the you know the grasses healthy or green uh, throughout those uh, summer period, we need to have irrigation come now. And <clears throat> so, if if it's improperly uh, covered, you you see those kind of dead spot uh, around. Uh, in your residential or in your home lawns, uh, it's pretty, pretty common. Uh, it doesn't mean that the grass is completely dead. I mean, if it's the it's drought stress and the, the grass is going to be not growing, because the crown's still alive and they kind of dormant uh, during the stress period. And once they water, once the rain, they start to come back. It take, Take a couple of weeks, but it's they're not completely dead. But as a, as you can see, there, those very looks like uh, looks like a browse stress, but actually this uh, homeowner uh, they think this is a drought spot, so they uh, turn the irrigation uh, every day to make the grasses hopefully recover. And but is a. Uh, even if they water every day, 
they're still losing grasses as you see it. And the later on, uh, find out this is uh, this is uh, from the chinchipoks. And I I look at visit in there and find out there's a lot of chinchipoks in there. So they spend like uh, over uh, 200, 300 dollars for water bill that month because they turn their irrigations every day. And but still they're losing the grasses and it's kind of frustrated. And uh, uh, I mean it's you know, uh, in the middle of summer is a quick fix that, yeah, you turn the irrigation to make the looks better, but but actually it's, it's not. So, uh, <clears throat> go to the next slide. So actually the uh, the chinch bug is, it, I mean, if you have a St. Allison grasses, you have to have some, some kind of uh, or you need, need, need right now, uh, if you have a Bermuda grass, Zoysia grasses, you don't worry about Chinchipo. But if you have a St. Allison grasses, you need to, you need to manage the St. Allison grasses. You, uh, you need to be aware that this, these insects can be uh, a problem. So the, <clears throat> the, as you see the symptom, uh, pretty much they, the grass is dead. I mean, they're completely dead. The 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 chinch bug is a piercing mouth part. It poke uh, the stolons and they uh, you know obtain the nutrition from the plant and you know, also they kind of uh, excreted some kind of toxin. So the the plants is completely dead once we're heavily infested and continuously feeding. And in addition to there is hot weather and the uh, some dead symptoms uh, started like you know short period of time two three weeks you see some uh, dead patch and then they're going to be keep increasing throughout the summer because their feeding activity continues. This insect is uh, is you know gregarious. They're grouped together. And they prefer the hot spot, full sun, uh, close to the concrete. Uh, they relatively don't like the shade under the tree, but they love to the open, open uh, area. And so the patch is, uh, is uh, starting from that hot spot and it keeps increasing. And so, it's kind of frustrated when the end, you know, the end of uh, summer, you, you're losing grasses, and and there is too late. I mean, there is the stolons already dead, and and there is nothing you can do about it at that point. Okay, so really, that uh, if you experience some losing grasses previous year, or um, uh, is is a good time to checking the any. Uh, these insects are present in your area. So it's good. Uh, it's as soon as the, we have a hot weather star, the uh, the adults will start to being active. And so you can, as I said, they are more congregated or they aggregate it, uh, make a groups in the hot spots. So you look at some full sun area next to your paveway or concrete, and and if you have a history before, you check those spots, and uh, you can use kind of soapy water, uh, one one teaspoon of uh, um, like a dishwash detergent, and put it in a gallon of water and mix well, and then and kind of pour around, and that it, that it, it, the the soap water not kill those bugs, but it irritate them to uh, to move around, and then they they can climb uh, on the tip of the leaves. As you can see the pictures, um, they kind of stay on the top of the leaf. So in a, in a minute, you can see if there is a, insects are there, then you, can, you probably see those uh, insects are crawling over. And if you see that, and I recommend it that you need some uh, insecticide apply, uh, even if there's no dead grasses yet. 
So they start to be active in uh, soon as this, soon as the temperature go up uh, 80, 90, which is uh, right now we we start to go uh, go up to above 90, 80, 90. So uh, you know, start in May, we can uh, we can check, check uh, you know some spot around your house if you have a Saint Augustine gas and check whether uh, you can see those insects. Okay, next slide. So the insect you can you can Google uh, the chinch bug. You can easily <clears throat> you can find different kind of pictures. This is a picture coming from the AgriLife uh, entomology website, and there is kind of different uh, instar, different shape, um, and then adult is uh, you, know, you can see those the white wing and it's kind of triangle uh, spot on their wing either side. And so pretty uh, distinctive is uh, kind of separate from the uh, many insects so easy to diagnose by the picture. However, the reality is can you see the dot on the paper? That's the size of the ginger book. You can, so right there, I make the dot the size of the ginger book. So, uh, I mean, it's magnifying glass. You can see that this kind of wing, but sometimes you can see the wing. It's so tiny. Um, it's about the size of a sesame seed. And also, they are moving fast. Okay, so if you investigate it in the turf, the, the thatch area, I mean, it's, it's this guy is so fast. And the, in, Immature, so insar even smaller than this spot. So, the if you've never seen it uh, at the real, real life condition, is 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 kind of you can you can easily miss that. Okay, so uh, soap water uh, can can help uh, to to identify or find some of the uh, chinchiba. Okay, so. Uh, so the if, if you see those insect, insect activity and uh, you can you can find some uh, you know from just the insecticides uh, from the you know store um, low, low garden store uh, it's uh, there should be okay is it is granular uh, will be fine and just uh, apply and then protect it and so reduce the population down at the early stages so that you are safe throughout the summer okay so that's what i have today so uh change book free turf this summer Hey, Meng, you're, you're muted. Erva, are you ready? Yes, Erva, go ahead. Erva is muted. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry, Erva, sorry for playing that little uh, trick on you. <laughs> It's all right. I thought I, I thought I muted myself, but then I, I guess you double muted me. <laughs> Can y'all see my screen uh, right now in full? Yes. Yep. All right. Excellent. So uh, I want to talk about uh, something that we saw in the last few weeks. You know, our, our azaleas here, at least in East Texas, have just started to go out of bloom. And uh, you'll notice on the foliage here that there is some white silver speckling. And we look a little bit closer, we start to see uh, what looks like some kind of sucking, piercing damage. So every single year, uh, I get this on my azaleas. And, you know, there's been times where I've, I've dealt with it. And other times I've found if I do nothing, uh, if anything, it hurts a little bit of the aesthetics in the landscape, but it usually does not decimate the plant. This is, I'd say, uh, a particular concern in a nursery setting. So if you're growing azaleas, you're probably very familiar with what uh, causes this type of damage. So getting a little bit closer, 
again, we can see that white speckling uh, damage. And essentially what we have here is a sucking insect pest on the underside. All right, so we look here, this is a type of a lace bug. Uh, specifically in this case, we're talking about the azalea lace bug and they feed on the undersides of the leaves. And so here is another a nice photo that you can see a little bit closer up of why they are called lace bugs is because of this lace-like, de very delicate lace-like pattern on their bodies. They look very interesting when you get in close. I would even, uh, I would even say rather beautiful. Uh, however, the damage that they cause is perhaps not that great. Uh, they do uh, hurt the aesthetics, the stuff they might actually hurt uh, or reduce the flowering or the yield of the plant as well. If we take a fancy schmancy ruler to this bad boy, you can see it's about an one eighth of an inch long. That's about how big they are uh, typically. And there are over 2000 species of lace bugs in general. So when we're talking lace bugs, right? So I, I, I know that uh, or I understand that uh, azaleas might be relatively specific to East Texas, but there are many different uh, lace bugs out there with over 2,000 species described, 17 of which or, or more uh, cause damage to ornamental trees and shrubs in the USA. And they leave this varnish-like excrement. So if you look on the underside, you'll also see these little brown droplets as well. So again, that's a sign that they are or have been there. And again, they can reduce flowering and plant vigor, and there have been some reports that in some, uh, for some species, they can sting humans. Uh, and it's apparently a relatively uh, unpleasant sting. So you can see these welts here left by uh, this sycamore lace bug. So they can fall out of trees and, uh, you know, they can potentially uh, sting and, and cause this type of uh, dermatitis. And I want to make it very clear, however, this is different than some type of infestation. So you're not going to get a sycamore lace bug infestation in the house or on the body, right? They're not going to infest uh, you. It, it, it can just be a, a sting or two. Uh, and you can have, if you have multiple fall on you, you might have multiple stings, but it's not very common. And again, they don't infest or linger around in human dwellings. Now, uh, there are some, uh, some, some azaleas that are considered relatively resistant to uh, azalea lace bugs. So here are some examples, uh, Indica alba, flame creeper, Delaware Valley white. So if azalea lace bugs are a common problem at your nursery, you may consider uh, trying to grow a little bit more of these resistant cultivars or concentrating insecticides on those that seem a little bit more susceptible. We have a number of predators, naturally occurring predators, such as azalea plant bug, which is different from azalea lace bug. We have tree crickets, uh, earwigs, minute pirate bugs. So this is a very small sucking uh, insect. Uh, it actually looks very similar in some ways to chinch bugs, but it is considered a beneficial. It feeds on other sucking insects. We have lacewing larvae. So you might be familiar with green lacewing. Uh, it's a type of a, it's like a green fly. Uh, it's not really a fly. It almost looks like a, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's a little green flying insect. I don't know how to describe it for you. But the larvae are like these little dragons with these uh, pincers as mandibles that will uh, inject digestive fluids and then suck their, the, the uh, prey live. We have spiders as well. There are some uh, cases where, again, so if you're uh, choosing one insecticide to spray or how to spray them, so a drench versus a contact, you may consider a method that would reduce impact on beneficials because they can provide some reasonable control, especially uh, they've shown in some uh, nursery settings and in the landscape especially, they will play a very important role. So if you spray the wrong thing, you might hurt your predators more than, than actually kill your pest and, and uh, increase the problem. But uh, as an example, there's this study here by Shrewsbury in 97, where uh, you have different rates of green lacewing larvae released per plant. So this is called augmentation biological control. You can actually buy uh, these beneficials. You can buy the larvae and release them. And you can see by six days after those releases of the beneficial insect, got about 79 to 88% reduction in the number of azalea lace bugs. Now, something like orthene gave about 100% control. So if you need good control, you're probably looking at an insecticide application. Mind you, something like orthene is gonna knock out any beneficials. So now if you have a source of azalea lace bugs or any type of a lace bug that might be coming to your crop nearby, you have just now basically nuked your plant, 
kill all the beneficials and you're going to have some of those lace bugs coming back again once that residual is, is gone. So uh, going to this option is going to require some relatively uh, frequent applications to, to maintain a clean crop. So we have a number of insecticide options to consider that, that are known to be uh, pretty effective against lace bugs, such as uh, acephate, dimethoate, carbaryl, malathion. All these are, are pretty harsh on our beneficials, as are our pyrethroids. So these are the active ingredients to look for, cyfluthin and bifenthrin. There are some systemic insecticides that may be Something uh, to consider when it comes to not actually hurting your beneficials directly, because you can apply them as a drench, so it's a metacloprid, dinotephrin, and a thymethoxam, but you need to be very cautious about when you apply these. So, uh, you know, read the label. Oftentimes, it will say you cannot spray when the plant is in bloom, uh, and you want to be cautious about how this might uh, impact pollinators, and in some cases, depending on where you're selling it, you might not even be able to use any of these because they're all considered uh, neonicotinoids in this class of insecticides that's being a little bit more restricted in its use. There's uh, this information and a, a whole lot more like specifically on the azalea lace bug. So if it's a recurring problem, all in this one a great review paper. If you need any more information, you want this paper for a nice, uh, you know, a pleasure read, uh, just let me know and I'd be more than happy to uh, share that with you. Uh, it's a great study. And that's all I had. Hey, uh, I, I want to mention uh, one thing. Uh, <clears throat> you know, you uh, azalea is more a uh, East Texas thing, and of course, mm -hmm. the, the rest of the whole Southeast United States. Uh, you know that uh, that's uh, uh, azalea. You know, it's more grown there, not so much in the rest of uh, uh, Texas. Um, yeah. Also, right now, uh, and uh, if it hasn't uh, shown up in uh, landscapes or in the nursery, uh, I think uh, lantana lace bug may be something that mm -hmm. folks uh, need to need to watch. Uh, just, just, uh, just absolutely. Like, uh, yeah. I, Lo, uh, I also want to mention that we have uh, we have a very special guest and uh, Laura Miller here. Laura, can you say something? Oh my goodness, Laura. Hi. Hi, Laura. Laura, hey. Laura Miller is our uh, port agent in Tarrant County, the uh, the Fort Worth area. Uh, and so I invited Laura to be a part of us. Um, Laura, I guess you probably don't have a webcam or something. Uh, do you have some input on the Facebooks? Oh, I, of course, in Fort Worth, we don't see a lot of azaleas that are very healthy. And I think probably because we don't see a lot of azaleas, we don't see a lot of azalea lace bug. But a uh, lantana <laughs> lace bug certainly does flare up usually in the heat of the summer. So almost almost every year. So definitely watch for the uh, lantana lace bugs, right? Uh, in the yeah. I mean, yeah. I, and usually what happens is people will notice that their lantana stop blooming you know and they're like what's my lantana blooming and then you look at it and it's just very infested with lace bugs so it's the easy one it's an easy easy problem to solve not the, not like some other ones but that one's an easy one so that could be a bit tricky if your lantana's in bloom and you got lace bugs because you really you want to be careful not to hit your pollinator, and, and pretty much all those contacts and systems we showed there are going to hurt pollinators. And so there are, you can use horticultural oils, soaps, soaps. and uh, botanicals like azadiractin, which comes from, from neem. However, they're going to have limited efficacy, so you would right. most likely need repeated applications. So that's something just to consider right and lace bugs usually being on the underside of the leaf kind of just even makes it challenging to get them with you know that's right yeah at least azadiractin so, has some translamer activity so it can go a little bit through the leaf and, the and leaf. so that can help a little yeah. but you're right you're right most of the time though when you have a lot of lace bugs the lantana will stop blooming at least temporarily um, well, that's good. Uh, <laughs> that's fortunate they, they, if you're right, looking to hit them with some to. insecticides. Right, they, <laughs> well, that's good enough. <laughs> Kevin, you're ready? I don't know. Show your screen. Oh, I uh, I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Kevin.
Kevin, I'm trying to unmute you. It wouldn't let me. And obviously, the uh, the the system is saying. Okay. Kevin, right? can, can you guys hear me now? Yes, can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we Good can. Good afternoon, can folks. Um, so what you should see on your screen, hey, I can hear you. So what what I see on what you should be seeing on the screen is a uh, unshameful promotion of this session here, chat with Green Aggies. Anyway, what I do want to bring up on the first slide, if it works. Where is my slides? There we go. It's a picture of a disease called Rayleigh spot on turf. So we had this question coming through the Facebook page asking, is the movement of Rayleigh spot from one lawn to another significantly affected by not cleaning a lawnmower between properties? If yes, what's a realistic cleaning procedure for a lawn mowing company. Kevin, that's Kevin, an you're a little scratchy. Hey, we have Dr. Yankee Joe. I am. Hang on, I'm going to switch out on, on, on microphones. Uh, probably because of your uh, $30 thing isn't working uh, properly. Time to upgrade. I, no, it, it, you want me to talk? Go ahead, Yankee. One of the things we got here is if you don't realize this, Yankee Joe is a turf pathologist. So go take it away, Yankee. So gray leaf spot is you can see those as gray leaf spot is you can see those as what? Hey, what is that? It's an echoing coming. So mute it, please. Okay, so the gray leaf spot, as you see in the picture, there's a, you have a, a round, kind of round uh, circle and then kind of dark uh, edge around. So this is a typical symptom gray leaf spot. And it's very common in the summer. Uh, it's, uh, those are spot in the, in, the, in the center is kind of gray color where there's a lot of spores produced. Okay, so now when you see those spot mean there is a spores producing from this area and then this spore is, is splashed by water, irrigation water, or it can by wind, uh, so it can easily uh, spread it uh, to the lawn. Okay, and so, Really, that uh, you know how how long this is uh, this spore is uh, produ I mean, distributed, which is I don't know, but it's it can be uh, it can be uh, you know distributed uh, you know local reason pretty quickly when it's very active. Oh, yeah, there's on the picture. Yeah, that's a magnified spore, and so kind of three segmented uh, you know eye drop shape. Okay, so uh, so it's uh, yeah it's spreading. Uh, very efficiently okay and so so how can we prevent those uh, spreading of the spore okay well the first thing is uh i mean if you're a lawn lawn more a uh, lawn care company you need to maintain those mowing and take care of the grasses you have to find which areas have a lot of uh gray leaf spot first okay and then you start to mowing uh those area highly infested area at the last okay so you 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 mowing the remaining uh area the healthy lawn area first okay and then mowing the last part in that section where I have a uh more uh, gravity spot symptoms so you 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 kind of you schedule the strategy of the mowing so you kind of maintain the 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 grass is kind of mowing the last uh, in your schedule. So the healthy grasses are kind of relatively uh, uh, prevented, okay, spreading those spore. And the second thing is, uh, if, if their areas are highly uh, infested, in, it's a good, good ways you can collect the, collect the clipping. I don't know if it's possible or not, but it's 
uh, some more has has the uh, you can actually collect the clipping while you're mowing. So some areas highly infested using uh, using uh, the bag, and so the areas are uh, mowing after uh, you collect the clipping, and then you kind of dispose uh, in, instead of just you know, just leave it in that spot. Okay, so that's the second option that you can uh, remediate it. And of course, you can if you be concerned. Then, then the you know, uh, for the applications, uh, something like a liquid type of fungicide will be then is helpful to uh, reduce the gray loose spot. Okay, and then uh, when you move to the next spot, I mean, it's, it's a good reason that you can you don't have to be a uh, corax around the, your equipment, but at least you can uh, clean it the water. Okay, so the no clipping. Uh, 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 left over from the infected area uh, would be helpful. This can this can uh, apply to any kind of turf disease, something like a, a large patch, and also uh, yeah, for example, large patch it can be also uh, pliable. So uh, trying to uh, you know strategize of your mowing uh, area and then collect the clipping if, if you concern. All right, thank you, Yonki. So just to recap for you guys real quick, you know, what is a realistic cleaning procedure? Uh, if, if you realize and you heard that the movement of the uh, pathogen could be on the plant debris, then a simple thing is just washing off your mowers, your mower deck, just to, to, to rinse off the plant debris, it's going to reduce the risk. Uh, and and realize it's not just gray leaf spot, but any other uh, uh, pathogen that could be harbored or could could be growing on that that plant material. So, and listen real carefully. If you want to go Clorox, if you want to do steam, you want to do soap, you can do that. But the, but the 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 simplest thing is is just rinse it off with a hose and rinse off those plant debris, and and that should reduce the risk tremendously and it would be a good practice not only for your people but also it, it helps serve your uh, customer as at least the next one down the, the, the street or the next one that you're going to so thank you for that questions and keep more questions coming into our Facebook uh, page and uh, Dr. Gu handles that one yes all right let me shift over and thank you yep, Jimmy go ahead Jimmy is the one who uh, who uh, you know sent that question in our Facebook page so thank you Jimmy for the question Hopefully we answered it. Uh, hopefully uh, Dr. Uh, Ong and Dr. Joe answered it uh, to perfection. I think so. their answer reminds me of, of this next slide, like washing your hands, washing your mower deck, works really well, prevents infection. So I was trying to figure out, gee, what topic <laughs> am I gonna talk a bit about today? And, and so I thought about, you know, economics and pest management in a, a production type system. And, and there's so many things we can learn about disease. So, so Dr. Joe and myself, we are plant pathologists. Essentially, we are people that study diseases and, and the, the fact that we have the word plant in our job description is to work with plants. Now, why do we work with plants? Many people have different reasons for doing that. For me, I like plants. Well, I like to see them get sick. So, but in any case, what I wanted to bring up was uh, just several days ago, um, there was a story that was put out um, on AgriLife Today, and it highlighted um, uh, comments from one of my colleagues, my research colleagues here, Dr. Karen Besholtoff, who is a virologist. And, and it was an interesting article that basically talks about the COVID-19 peak isn't at the end yet. And we can learn all this stuff looking at what we know about diseases, even in plants. So a few things to learn here, as Laura already said, how do you prevent some of these things? Same common sense principle, clean your hands, clean out the deck of the mower so you don't spread it around. And, and a lot of it has to do with knowing a little bit about the pathogen. So. Next slide I have here to show you, and this is actually in the article, is talking about epidemics, and we call this the disease triangle. And they would say disease happens because 
there is a susceptible host, there is a pathogen, and there's a favorable environment. So th this is a, a funny quote uh, that, that was taken from some of the, uh, 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 I guess, the briefings that I saw it. At one time, I think uh, the, the person who is, who is pretty on the forefront on the, the coronavirus and, and COVID-19 is Dr. Fossey, who said, you know, we don't make timelines uh, to, to when this ends. It's the virus that makes a timeline. So keep in mind here, the pathogen plays a role. In terms of, of plant pathogens, it's the same thing. But what is it that we can do to disrupt uh, that disease from happening or to create situations to reduce disease? And if you notice on the uh, triangle uh, on the right, you notice what we try to do is always try to create some sort of unfavorable uh, environment. And, and what that does is it disrupts that relationship uh, between the pathogen onto the susceptible host. Now, so how does this relate to how to save a buck in production systems? Well, I have a couple of friends in the production, uh, in, in, in nursery production, and I remember one of them told me just about two weeks ago, and he says that at a time where, where something like this happens, where there's a big economic hit, the first thing that we can usually throw out is our uh, preventative treatments because chemicals are expensive. And I'm like, okay. Uh, you know, that's like going to a casino. Um, he says, well, are there ways to make the odds better? I said, absolutely. And it takes a little bit of education. And, and what that means is if you understand what kind of pathogen you're dealing with or you might have to deal with, then you might say, maybe I can go two additional weeks without a spray. You're going to save a little bit of money there. Uh, so that's one way of saving is, is, is looking at the risk management aspects of it. And you can make good decisions if you know what sort of pathogens you're dealing with. But beyond that, there are things that you can do that you are probably already practicing. And you don't realize this by just amping this up a little bit is great ways to save money and actually to increase sort of what I call non-invasive methods uh, to reduce the need for pesticides. So this is an image that I took of a, a, a nursery production. And if you notice those plants, I think those were all boxwoods. I don't remember, I took this a bunch of years ago. You notice how they are, they are blocks of those plants. That hey, blocking. Uh, Kevin, Kevin, just want you to know yep. that we have some uh, very distinguished guests from uh, nurseries like Rampro Farm, Creekside, and Bailey Nursery, just so you know. Excellent, yes. So I think Mr. Cartwright is around, however, great. So this is a, an image of a good operation, and I think most of you that, that run operation like this have, have seen this sort and, and actually have, have done something like this, which is called blocking. But I don't know if you realize that by blocking, you are actually creating islands. And, and those islands are to help prevent uh, uh, what we call fast explosive epidemics. Those areas, if something happened in one of those islands, you would hope that the space between those islands would be somewhat of a deterrent for that pathogen to go quickly and spread down that row. Now, this is one approach to it. In the agronomic area, uh, uh, we try to not have monoculture. And some of you might not realize that in a cotton field that's grown to a particular cotton variety, the breeders may have chosen anywhere between five to 20 different lines, which means different genetics that produces the same traits to put out there. And they do this because when you have all these different types of genetics and you get a pathogen coming attacking one or maybe two, uh, compatible with one or two types of genetics, the ones that are not compatible with the uh, pathogen might go about not getting sick as quickly or not getting sick at all. So to take a, an approach where you ha might have a little bit more uh, space, you can make 
smaller blocks, creating more islands. That's one strategy to reduce uh, spread quickly. Uh, sometimes the idea of uh, uh, what they call permaculture principles, using uh, blocking by, by putting uh, different plants in those blocks, uh, individual blocks, is also another method of, of trying to slow the spread. And the idea is a pathogen will uh, be often very specific to uh, some types of plants, but not others. And so by creating barriers, they cannot jump across the islands uh, uh, to get get others if they're not compatible or not uh, uh, the plant that, that was in that adjacent island is not compatible. This is another image of, of, of geraniums. Uh, some of you know geraniums is in the news lately. We're not gonna chat about that, but what I just want to show you, a good practices that most of you are already doing is spacing. Uh, one of the reasons of spacing is to, to reduce humidity around the plant. Most pathogens, whether they're bacteria or they're, whether they're fungi, um, um, love humidity. Uh, so if you can space them and encourage air movement um, to, to basically reduce humidity around the plant, you reduce the risk for potential infection from fun fungal agents or bacterial uh, pathogens. So the other thing I, I do have is if, what if spacing becomes an issue and you get a situation like this where everything is stuck on a table? What can you do? Great question, you know? Would it be take a little bit of time and, and, and tighten up how you deal with fertility, how you deal with irrigation, perhaps understanding or having some method to measure irrigation so you don't overwater it and end up with, with issues uh, such as root rots. So there are many, many non-chemical approaches uh, uh, to things uh, that you're doing to save a buck or two. And a lot of it has to do be just little tweaks of what you're already doing. And, um, um, and, and I think uh, careful consideration, smart consideration, um, it's, it's a way to continue to save a, a few bucks here and there. Um, you know, probably not the huge number of bucks that you might be thinking, but at least uh, what I, uh, my buddy used to say is a few bucks goes a long way. Change of gears for the landscapers, the folks out there, things that are seen through my email. Well, we got this one uh, and, and it was not the only one. We got about four different emails with this sort of pictures where they said tips of oak trees uh, look like they got hit by herbicide. Well, if you take a closer look, hopefully you realize on the veins, it looked gnarly. Well, guess what? That's an insect right there. The, what is it, the vein pocket gall. Is that right, Erfan? Yeah, when that gets on early as the leaf is expanding, it can make that leaf look funky. And it, and, and it might freak some people out thinking that, oh my gosh, my neighbor is trying to kill my plant with some herbicide. No, you know, if you guys call out to some sort of uh, uh, cases as, as those and, and, and your clients are, are trying to blame their neighbors or whatnot of the city, Take a close look at it. If it has those pocket veins, uh, one of the few questions to ask is when did they first notice it? Uh, and if you notice the pocket veins and, and majority of the sample that you might picked off, that's your answer right there. So it is an insect problem. Um, eventually you'll grow out of it. At this point, it probably, you know, aesthetically looks horrible. Uh, I'm not sure what you can do in terms of, 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 of uh, chemical treatment or some treatment. Airfan, can you contribute to that by any? Uh, not off the top of my head. They, they can be tricky because they are, you know, in the plant foliage. There you go. So I like to say you can't beat them, join them. Look at it and enjoy it. Look at the pretty gnarly, who knows, maybe there's even some Fibonacci uh, fractal plants in there. Another thing that's big in the news and, and coming back up is Rose Rosette. We have been getting uh, uh, reports of this. This is actually one that came out of Travis County. And, and, and uh, so that's Round Rock area. So folks, be on the lookout. Rose Rosette is starting to show up again because it's starting to get warm and everything's leafing out. Uh, and, and remember, 
some roses will produce new flush that is maroon or red unless it's a cultivar that's not supposed to produce those reddish new growth don't worry about it new growth is not rose rosette next this was the one that i posted on my friday post um and we had a uh, fan of our texas plant clinic facebook page sent in this marigold and this is actually at the crown where it was really gnarly and it had all this knobs, correct them? It's a gall. And so I look at this picture and I said, I think it's very likely for this time of the year and the moisture that we're getting, it is probably uh, agrobacterium gall or crown gall caused by the bacteria, agrobacterium tumefaciens. Well, my diagnostician took a look at that and said, you know what, you need to take a closer look at the roots too, because another thing that could cause that could be root knot nematodes. And she was absolutely correct. In this picture, we don't have a clear shot of the roots. And if we had had the uh, um, client knock off those sand at the roots and expose the roots and you see, see knots on those roots, then it would be uh, a root knot nematode. Um, so, just looking at this image alone, I still think it's agrobacterium. But hey, until we get a sample, we can't be absolutely sure. That's what I got for this week. And thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Uh, do you guys see my slides? Yes. Okay, I, I, I see also, your screen again anyway. Oh, yeah, you see my screen. These uh, beautiful container emulsion, right? Um, I also yes. want to uh, recognize some of my uh, uh, outstanding colleagues in and out of state. Uh, Dr. Matthew Chapel from University of Georgia is, is in the audience, and also two of our uh, uh, agents, ag agents, uh, Stephen and um, and Skip Richter are uh, both on, on, on this uh, webinar. So thank you so much for uh, uh, being with us today. Uh, I want to mention something about container mulching. If this is kind of uh, tag, tagging along with uh, what Kevin, what Dr. Ong was talking about, you know, uh, the preventatives. So um, in the greenhouse production, uh, you know, because of the environment, the enclosed environment, Uh, because of the enclosed environment, you know, there are not that many options uh, of uh, herbicides, you know, that you could use uh, in 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 these uh, enclosed, you know, uh, greenhouses. So uh, so mulching is is being, you know, mulching using a rice hulls has been uh, explored a lot uh, to prevent. Uh, to prevent, uh, to control, you know, to prevent the uh, germination or coming up of uh, liverwort and bittercress and many other, uh, uh, many other container weeds. Um, I haven't done specifically research on this, but uh, uh, Dr. James Altland, Dr. James Altland from USDA ARS uh, has done plenty of research and as you can see that on this image here, you know, the rice hull mulch provides excellent control of uh, bittercress and liverwort. And from the left to right, these are covered by a one inch, half inch, a quarter inch, and zero. So that's no uh, rice hulls. And you can see the difference is, uh, uh, is very significant. So I think in this one, he put both uh, bittercress and liverwort if you don't remember what they look like. So this is a uh, bitter crest. You probably, you know, recognize this little mustard thing and this is the liverwort. It's not, it's liverwort is actually not a plant, but still, you know, this moisture, constant moisture in the uh, substrate, in the pot and substrate really help uh, these two things to grow and, you know, and become an issue. And in this picture, it shows that, you know, the, um, the rice holes uh, make an inhospitable site for weed germination. And this photo shows oxalis, uh, oxalis seeds uh, in these red circles. And these are uh, very common, you know, in our greenhouses here uh, uh, in Texas. Uh, so they are, they're on these uh, substrate service, you know, so 
you know, oxalis seeds, they just like, they have those, they don't have parachute, but when they, uh, the, the seed pods split, they jump pretty uh, uh, significant distance. Uh, but once they jump on the surface of these uh, uh, container mulch, in this particular case, rice hulls, you know, they were shown that they were unable to germinate after uh, six weeks. So that's, uh, that's pretty phenomenal. That's pretty phenomenal. So I'm going to try to put this uh, in the handout and uh, send it to you guys. Uh, next thing I want to mention, uh, uh, Dr. Ong, uh, we don't want to compete with you, but I think Great Myrtle Bark Scale is competing to occupy Texas, uh, you know, against uh, uh, Rose Rosette. Um, I want to show this picture from Dr. David Cole at Clemson University. In our research, we have been using uh, double-sided sticky tape uh, to to uh, to you know to um, trace you know the number of uh, uh, Kramer of bark scale crawlers on the plant. But I saw this picture on his Dr. David Cole's uh, Twitter feed. They're using this black uh, black tape, uh, and I thought that was really brilliant because you know with this back with this uh, black background, and uh, you know the the pinkish uh, crawlers get on it. It's very visible. So this could be a very good monitoring tool. This could be a very good monitoring tool for you uh, crate myrtle uh, bark scale guys uh, out there. And, and today, and I actually got a picture, uh, not a picture, an email from Dr. Gary Knox at the University of Florida, one of our collaborators, you know, somebody sent from Maryland. Unfortunately, this thing has a spread to uh, Maryland. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, somebody find that there, they were trying to see whether, you know, where to report this and stuff. So I just want to let, let you know if you've seen this, this is a very good uh, 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 monitoring tool, I think, uh, you know, reported at stopcmbs.com. Um, and, and that's just black electrical tape that they've basically inverted and, and overlapped it. Um, so the sticky side is out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, well, this one for this uh, black one, yes, the the sticky side they overlap, uh, you know, like a quarter inch a little bit, and so uh, uh, it will still get on the, uh, you know, the the uh, the tape will stay on the trunk, and then you know the insect, the crawlers, the crawlers get on the uh, the sticky side. I forgot to mention another uh, guest in our audience. It's uh, it's uh, she she doesn't work in the academic. Uh, uh, she's uh, Suzanne, the Buck Lady. Suzanne, uh, thank you for being a very loyal uh, audience in our, uh, you know, thank you for coming to our uh, webinar. Um, I, again, uh, though that's the last slide of my webinar. I just want to, you know, invite you to, uh, to, you know, uh, send your questions to uh, chat with uh, Green Aggies. Uh, it used to be something else, but I changed the name to chat with uh, Green Aggies. Uh, you know, send us your uh, questions, uh, images, you know, the things that you want us to talk about, um, you know, in the in the Facebook page. Um, that's uh, that's that's all I have to, for today. Uh, you guys, do you have anything else that you want to mention? Kevin, Yankee, Erfong, and uh, Laura. And anyone in the audience, uh, go ahead, type in your questions. I, I figure out that, uh, that you know, unmute all of you is just going to create a, a chaotic situation. So any of you um, got a question or something that you want to talk, uh, just type it in the uh, chat. Oh, Dr. Matthew Chappell said that we guys, uh, you guys are rocking. Oh, wow, that's uh, that's a high, uh, that's high, high uh, compliment. That's very nice of you, Dr. Chappell. 